We thank you, Lord, for Jesus Christ, your, your son. We pray that uh, your spirit would guide us in our studies this day. We ask your blessing. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, I have us at uh, James 3, 2. Yep. Yes. Okay. There are many things in which we all slip up. But if a man never slips up in his speech, he is a perfect man, able to keep the whole body also in the rain. Here, James sets down two ideas which were woven into Jew Jewish thought and literature. There is no man in this world who does not sin in something. The word which James uses means to slip up. Life, said uh, Lord Fisher, the great sailor, is strewed with orange peels. Skin is, sin is so often not deliberate, but the result of a slip up when we are off our guard. This university of sin runs all through the Bible. There is none righteous, not one, quotes Paul. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 10, whatever. If we say that we have no sin, says John, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. There is not a just man upon the earth that does not does good and sins not, uh, said the preacher in Ecclesiastics. There is no man, says the Jewish saga, sage, among them that be born but hath dealt wickedly, and among the faithful, there is none who hath not done amiss. <laughs> that somewhere read is Esterus. Uh, there is no room for pride in human life, for there is not a man upon earth who has not some blot of which to be ashamed. Even the pagan writers have the same conviction of sin. It is in the nature of man to sin both in private and in public said the Theodius. We all sin, said Seneca, some more grievously, some more lightly. On clemency first, oh, yeah, all men are involved in sin. And notice that none of the women are, but it's all men. Uh, there is no sin into which it is easier to fall, and no sin which has graver consequences than the sin of the tongue. Against this is woven into Jewish thought. Again, this is Jesus himself warned men that they were would give account for every word they spoke. By thy word thou shalt be justified, and by thy word will thou shalt be condemned. A soft answer, truth turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perversiveness therein is a branch of the spirit. Perseverance. Okay. Of all Jewish writers, Jesus ben Sarek, the writer of Ecclesiastes, was most impressed with the terror of the evil potentialities of the tongue. Honor and shame is in talk, and the tongue of man is his fall, but not called a whisper, and lie not in wait with the tongue. For a foul shame is upon the thief, and an evil condemnation upon the double tongue. Instead of a friend, become not the enemy, for thereby thou shalt inherit an ill name, shame, and reproach, even so shall a sinner that hath a double tongue. That's Ecclesiastes. Blessed is a man who has not slipped with his mouth. Who is he that hath not offended with his tongue? Who shall set a watch before my mouth and seal of wisdom upon my lips that I shall not suddenly fall by them and that my tongue destroy me not? He asked a lengthy passage, which is so nobly and passionately said that it is 
worth quoting in full, crossed the whisper and the double tongue, crossed, must be cursed, the whisper and the double tongue, for such have destroyed many that were at peace. Um, backbiting tongue hath disquieted many and driven them from nation to nation. Strong cities hath it pulled down and overthrown the house of great men. It hath cut in pieces the forces of the people and done strong nations. A backbiting tongue hath cast out the virtuous women and deprived them of their labors. Whoso hearketh unto it shall never find rest and never dwell quickly, quietly, neither shall he have a friend in whom he may repose. The stroke of the whip marketh, maketh marks in the flesh, but the stroke of the tongue breaketh the bones. Many may fall by the edge of the sword, but not so many as have fallen by the tongue. Well is he that is defended from it, and has not passed through the venom thereof, who has not drawn the yoke thereof, nor hath been bound in her bands. For the yoke thereof is a yoke of iron, and the bands thereof are bands of brass. The death thereof is the evil death, the grave where better than it. Look that thou hedge thy passion above with thorns and bind up thy silver and gold and weigh thine words in a balance and make a bridle for the lips and make a door and a bar for the mouth. Beware thou slide not by it lest thou fall before him that layeth in wait and thy fall be incredible unto death. Wow. Okay. So no man can say that he hath not been warned of the dangers of the tongue, and no man can say that he has entirely avoided them. Comments? Can you hear me? I, I can hear you now. Yeah, I was, uh, you know, watching a documentary yesterday on the Gospel of Mark, and the actor was, uh, you know, quoting Christ that uh, it's not what uh, enters a man, but what comes out of him, out of his mouth, uh, to really condemns him. And I think, uh, you know, James' uh, comments here really, you know, parallel that fairly closely. I really expand on it quite a bit, actually. So I think it's a good comment on that teaching from our Lord. But back to Barclay here, although I mentioned that uh, these, uh, you know, apocryphal Old Testament works were, you know, allowed in the Orthodox and Catholic churches, though not, you know, doctrinal, it's kind of interesting how much enthusiasm Barclay, a Protestant, has for for Ecclesiasticus and some of these writers. Anyway, the, the, the commentary from James is well taken and a you know powerful uh, a commentary on our Lord's teachings. I'm trying to remember uh, way, way back in parochial school. I, Catholic parochial school, I think uh, slander and gossip were considered mortal sins. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I remember correctly. That's how serious it was. Okay. Yeah. I guess we could check the Catholic uh, catechism for them. Yeah. What's interesting to me is what it reminded me of is uh, Isaiah, where you know they the angels touched his mouth with burning coals. He said, "I'm, a, you know, I'm, I'm a sinner, a man with, you know, eat. Yeah, and they and they and they did it to the mouth. Interesting. 
Yeah. It's interesting in the what really happens within us is that when we start speaking, we are kind of crystallizing all the different emotions and thoughts that we have. And they become verb when they become verbalized, they become real. Okay, well, let's go on. James 3, 3, 5 uh, through 5a. Uh, Dave, you want to take that? Dave, you're muted. Okay, how's that? I can hear you, Dave. Okay. Hear you. All right. If we put bits into horses' mouths to make them obedient to us, we can control the direction of their whole body as well. Look at ships, too. See how large they are and how they are driven by rough winds and see how the course is altered by a very small rudder. Wherever the presence of the steersman desires, so too the tongue is a little member of the body and it makes arrogant claims for itself. It might be argued against James' terror of the tongue that, that it is a very small part, part of the body to make, make such a fuss about and to which to attach so much importance. To combat that argument, James uses two pictures. We put a bit in the mouth of a horse, knowing that if we can control its mouth, we can control its whole body. So James says that if, if we can control the tongue, we can control the whole body. But if the tongue is uncontrolled, the whole, the whole life is set on, on the wrong way. A rudder is very small in comparison with the size of a ship, and yet by exerting pressure on that little rudder, the steersman can alter the course of the ship and direct it to safety. Long before Aristotle had used this same picture when he was talking about the science of mechanics. A rudder is small and is attached to the very end of the ship, and it has such power that by this little rudder and by the power of one man and that a power gently exerted, the great bulk of the ship can be moved. The tongue also is small, yet it can direct the whole course of a man's life. Philo, is that Philo? Or? Yeah, that's Philo, the, the um, Jewish, um, I'm gonna say historian, the philosopher. That reminds me of uh, somebody, uh, Philo Farnsworth. This buddy, you know who he is. He invented uh, the so, TV. The television uh, a cathode ray inventor, I think. He did, yes. It, and he was my stepmother's uncle. And oh, really? Yeah, he was, he was spent a lot of time around here. And I think he was... Uh, Mormon born and raised in Idaho. But, yes. uh, yeah, he spent a lot of time working in Salt Lake City on those projects. Well, the whole story goes, just to, just to be on the quick side, the RCA kind of stole his thunder way back when with the TV. And they, they, they took it and they developed it. And of course, they made all this money on it. But uh, Philo, she always called him Uncle Philo. And then... He was just a good guy. That's what, that's the story I got anyway. That's good. Yeah. Okay. And that's probably, he was, I don't know how anybody would get a name like that, but now that, now that I see this, this is the only other time I've seen somebody with the name Philo. Yeah. Well, the family must have been fans of Jewish philosophy. I guess so. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Philo, Philo called the mind uh, the charioteur, charioteur, tire, and steersman of a man's life. It is when the mind controls every word and itself is controlled by Christ that life is safe. James is not for a moment saying that 
Silence is better than speech. He is not pleading for a Trappist life where speech is forbidden. He is pleading for the control of the tongue. Aristippus, the Greek, had a wise saying, the conqueror of pleasure is not the man who never uses it. He is the man who uses pleasure as a rider, guides a horse, or a steersman directs a ship, and so directs them wherever he wishes. Abstention from anything is never a complete substitute for control in its use. James is not pleading for a cowardly silence, but for a wise use of speech. Okay, well, a wise use of speech. I'm, I'm reminded of the, the book of Job when the uh, friends of Job come and sit with him for seven days and don't say anything. And he derives some comfort from that. And then they start saying things. And uh, he, as his friends become his adversary, really. Okay, a destructive fire. James 5, 5b to 6. Um, Diane, you want to take that? See how great a forest, how little a fire can set alight. And the tongue is a fire. In the midst of our members, the tongue stands for the whole wicked world. For it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the ever reoccurring cycle of creation and is itself set on fire by hell. The damage the tongue can cause is like that caused by a forest fire. The picture of the forest fire is common in the Bible. It is the prayer of the psalmist that God may make the wicked like chaff before the wind and that his tempest may destroy them as fire consumes the forest and the flames set the mountains ablaze. Isaiah says wickedness burns like a fire. It consumes briar and thorns. It kindles the thicket of the forest. Zechariah speaks of a blazing pot in the midst of wood, like a flaming torch among sheaves. The picture was one the Jews of Palestine knew well. In the dry season, the scanty grass and low-growing thorn bushes and scrubs were as dry as tinder. If they were set on fire, the flames spread like a wave which there was no stopping. The picture of the tongue as the fire is also a common Jewish picture. A worthless man plots evil and his speech is like a scorching fire, says the writer of Proverbs. As pitch and tow, so a hasty contention kindleth fire, Ecclesiastes. There are two reasons why the damage which the tongue can do is like a fire. One, it is wide ranging. The tongue can damage at a distance. A chance word dropped at one end of the country or the town can finish up by bringing grief and hurt at the other. The Jewish rabbis had this picture. Life and death are in the hand of the tongue. Has the tongue a hand? No, but as the hand kills, so the tongue. The hand kills only at close quarters. The tongue is called an arrow because it kills at a distance. An arrow kills at 40 or 50 paces, but the tongue is said, but of the tongue, it is said, they set their mouths against the heavens and their tongue struts through the earth. It's range over the whole earth and reaches to heaven. That indeed is the peril of the tongue. A man can ward off a blow with the hand, for the striker must be in his presence. But a man can drop a malicious word or repeat a scandalous or untrue story about someone whom he does not even know or about someone who stays hundreds of miles away and cause infinite harm. Number two, it is uncontrollable. In the tender dry conditions of Palestine, a forest fire was almost immediately out of control and no man can control the damage of the tongue. Three things come not back. 
the spent arrow, the spoken word, and the lost opportunity. There is nothing so impossible to kill as a rumor. There is nothing so impossible to obliterate as an idle and malicious story. Let a man, before he speaks, remember that once a word is spoken, it is gone from his control. And let him think before he speaks, because although he cannot get it back, he will most certainly answer for it. Well, uh, certainly speaks to uh, say, uh, if you can't say something good, don't say anything at all. Well, let's see. Our next section is corruption within. Buddy, you want to take that? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the corruption within, James 3, 5. We must spend a little longer on this passage because in it there are two specially difficult phrases. The tongue, says the RSV, is, <clears throat> is uh, an unrighteous world that ought to be the unrighteous world that ought to be the unrighteous world. In our bodies, that is to say, the tongue stands for the whole wicked world. In Greek, the phrase is hokosmos tesadikias. And we shall at best get at its meetings, but remember that cosmos can have two meanings. It can mean adornment, although this is less usual. The phrase, therefore, can mean that the tongue is the adornment of evil. That would mean that it is the organ which can make evil attractive. By the tongue, men can make the worst appear the better reason. By the tongue, men can excuse and justify their wicked ways. By the tongue, men can persuade others into sin. There is no doubt that this gives excellent sense, but it is doubtful if the phrase really can mean that. Cosmos can mean world. In almost every part of the New Testament, cosmos means the world with more than a suggestion of the evil world. Uh, the world can, cannot receive the spirit. Jesus manifests itself to the disciples, uh, but, not, but not in the, manifests himself to the disciples, but not to the world. The world hates him and therefore hates his disciples. John's kingdom, it, it, Jesus' kingdom is not of this world, John 18. Paul condemns the wisdom of this world. The Christian must not be condemned to the world. When cosmos is used in this sense, it means the world without God. The world in its importance and, of, and often is its hostility to God. The world in its ignorance of, and often, its hostility to God. Therefore, if we call the tongue the evil cosmos, this means that it is that part of the body which is without God. An uncontrolled tongue is like a world hostile to God. It is the part of us which disobeys him. The second difficult phrase is what the RSV translates the cycle of nature, uh, trochos genesios. It uh, literally means the wheel of being. Uh, the ancients used the picture of the wheel to describe life in four different ways. The wheel is a circle, a rounded and complete whole, and therefore the wheel of life can mean the totality of life. Two, any particular point in the wheel is always moving up or down. Therefore, the wheel of life can stand for the ups and downs of life. And then since, in this sense, the phrase very nearly means the wheel of fortune, always changing and always variable. Uh, three, the world is circular. It's always turning back upon itself in exactly the same circle. Therefore, the wheel came to stand for the cyclical repeti repetition of life, the weary round of an existence which is ever repeating itself without advancing. The phrase had one particular technical use. The Orphic religion believed that the human soul was continually undergoing a process of birth and death and rebirth, and the aim of life was to escape from his from this treadmill into infinite being. The Orphic devotee who had achieved could say, I have, I have flown out of the sorrowful, weary world. In this sense, the wheel of life can stand for the weary treadmill of constant reincarnation. 
it's unlikely that James knew anything about Orphic reincarnation. It's not at all likely that any Christian would think in terms of a cyclical life, which was not going anywhere. It is not likely that a Christian would be afraid of the chances and changes of life. Therefore, the phrase most probably means the whole of life and being. What James is saying is that the tongue can kindle a destructive fire which can destroy all life. And the tongue itself is kindled with the very fire of hell. Here indeed is its terror. Well, I think uh, this idea of uh, the soul, the circle of life and all that did in fact exist at the time of uh, uh, Jewish thought and was uh, anathema. Um, this is uh, Hinduism and uh, the, that idea of, uh, that led to Gnosticism that uh, you know the, the body and created things were evil and uh, therefore the soul needed to escape the body and it did make a difference what you did with the body so I don't know if you can, can take completely take that out of the picture but uh, what he comes down to uh, distills at the end is uh, reasonable Okay, uh, let's go on then, Beyond All Taming, uh, James 3, 7, and 8. Uh, Robert, would you take that? Robert, you need to unmute. He needs to unmute. Can you hear me? Yep, now we can. All right. Every kind of beasts and birds and reptiles and fishes is and has been tamed for the service of mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. The idea of taming of the animal creation in the service of mankind is an idea which often occurs in Jewish literature. We get it in the creationist story. God said of man, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, Genesis. It is, in fact, to that verse that James is very likely looking back. The same promise is repeated to Noah. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, and upon every fowl of the earth, and upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea into your hand they are delivered. The writer ecclesiastically repeats the same idea. God put the fear of man upon all flesh and gave him dominion over beasts and fowls. The psalmist also thought on the same lines. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. They have put all the things under his feet. All sheep, all oxen, yea, and all beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whoever passes, and whatever sort of passes through path, paths of the sea. The, world, the Roman world knew of the tame fish in the fish ponds, which were in the open, which were in the open central hall or atrium of a Roman house. The serpent was the emblem, emblem of Cephalus, and his temples, and in his temples, tame servant, serpents glided about, and were supposed to be incarnations of the god. People who were ill ill slept in the temples of except I won't even try that at night and if one of these tame servants glided over them that was supposed to be the healing touch of God 
Man's ingenuity, as James sees it, has tamed every wild creature. Is the tongue alone is beyond taming. To tame means to control and to render useful and beneficial. That, says James, is what no man by his own unaided efforts has ever been able to do with the, with the tongue. All, all those all those passages, passages about men, mankind controlling, having dominion, the uh, animal rights people hate that. Well, um, actually, control and dominion over also means responsibility for. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, but I, they, why they, they still hate it. Say that because it it means that we human beings have a responsibility for those animals as much as we have the right to use them. Um, but they they would dispute that. They they would they believe honestly believe. The well, most extreme of them is animals are equal to humans. I guess there's room for enlightenment. <laughs> there's a point in Revelation that says that uh, those who have destroyed the earth will be responsible to the Lord. That includes the animals of the earth. I think the animals do a pretty good job of coexisting with each other. Yeah, well, it, it was, uh, my grandfather said, don't kill it if you're not going to eat it. Yeah. And for somebody to go over to Africa just to, to, just to kill a beast for sport, I don't know if, if that's what, what God intended. I really don't. Or what James is, what they're trying to say in James here. Well, I, when I'm reading James, I'm thinking of the great white shark. And uh, I'm also thinking of, of the book of Revelations where it says that a third of the earth will be killed by uh, disease, by, uh, by the animals, and... Uh, so again, you look at that and you say, okay, well, then we get a little more shark attacks now. <laughs> but uh, the sharks are also used for food. So uh, they almost went ex or were going extinct before that point. Now we, we seem to, you know, try to, to give them room to grow. <laughs> they, they always talk about I saw a thing on TV about the killer whales, and honestly, that's their nickname is killer whales. Their real name is, uh, it escapes me what they actually, what species they are, but. Are they orcas or orcas? Yeah, orcas. Okay. That, yeah, and orcas are, oh yeah, they're ferocious beasts, and they hunt and, and kill for food in the ocean but they don't kill anything just for the sake of killing it well they no, they kill it because they eat it and uh oh, yeah, yeah. I, during, during the week dave I, I i saw an interesting quote uh by mark twain that uh, touches on this kind of animal human comparison and twain said if a man picks up a stray dog and cares for it and makes it prosperous and you know brings it into a state of well-being the dog will not bite the hand of the man that is the chief difference between a dog and a man <laughs> okay. so, <laughs> but uh, back to the back to the the the, uh, the restoration of uh, creation i remember and i don't know this certainly isn't doctrine but uh, i remember once i i was uh, in a, a church group and a, one of the ladies was distraught because her her dog had passed away and the priest, uh, actually one of my teachers said, well, remember the book of Revelation teaches us that uh, in the end all creation will be restored, so. 
Uh, For what it's worth. <laughs> I would rather go to where it says all uh, all life reports to God. All right. It gets held accountable by God. So we have a gracious God, so those those uh, pets uh, are uh, his gifts to us over the period of time that we have them but they all have a responsibility or accountability to the Lord. So as Martin Luther said, if it takes that to make you happy, it'll be there. <laughs> okay, well, this next section, Susan, do you want to take that? Sure, I'll do that. Blessing and cursing. James 3, 9 through 12. With it, we bless the Lord and Father, and with it, we curse the men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth, there emerges blessing and cursing. These things should not be so, my brothers. Surely the one stream from the same cliff in the rock does not gush forth fresh and salt water. Surely, brothers, a fig tree cannot produce olives, nor a vine of nor a vine figs, nor can salt water produce fresh water. We know only too well from experience that there is a split in human nature. In human beings, there is something of an ape and something of an angel, something of the hero and something of the villain, something of the saint and much of the sinner. It is James' conviction that nowhere is this contradiction more evident than in the tongue. With it, he says, we bless God. This is was especially relevant to a Jew. Whenever the name of God was mentioned, a Jew had to respond, blessed be he. Three times a day, devout Jews had to repeat the shrom ish, I don't know, the famous 18 prayers called elegies. Every one of these begins, blessed be thou, O God. God was indeed the blessed one the one who was continually blessed. And yet the very mouths and tongues which had frequently and piously po blessed God were the very same mouths and tongues which cursed their neighbors. To James, there was something unnatural about this. It was unnatural as for a stream to gush forth, forth both fresh and salt water or a bush to bear different kinds of fruit unnatural and wrong such things might be they were typically common peter could say even though i must die with you i will not deny you matthew and the very same tongue of the of his deny of his denied jesus with oaths and curses matthew the john who said little children love one another was the same one once wanted to call down fire from heaven in order to destroy a Samaritan village. Luke, even the tongues of the apostles could say different things. Let John me, Bert, let me go ahead. right there for a minute because we'll lose this thought otherwise. Uh, when James and John wanted to call down uh, fire from heaven, Jesus said, you're a different spirit than I am. And um, that was a rebuke. The, his spirit later certainly filled both of them. Um, so I don't know if this is a valid statement, um, but it does give an example of, of uh, blessing or curses. 
there's an old saying, if somebody has a loose tongue, is that basically what James is referring to? Yeah. Okay, shall I go on? Please, do. Uh, John Byron tells us of talkative. He was a saint abroad and a devil at home. Many people speak with perfect courtesy to strangers and may even preach love and gentleness and yet snap with impatient irritability at their own family. It was not unknown for someone to speak with piety on Sunday and to curse a team of workers on Monday. And it has not been unknown for someone to utter the most pious sentiments one day and to repeat the most questionable stories the next. It has not been unknown for someone to speak with sweet graciousness at a religious meeting and then go outside to destroy another person's reputation with a malicious tongue. These things, said James, should not be. Some drugs are both poison and cures. They are benefits to a patient when wisely controlled by a doctor but harmful when used unwisely. The tongue can bless or curse. It can wound or soothe. It can speak the fairest or the foulest of things. It is one of life's hardest and plainest duties to see that the tongue does not contradict itself, but speaks only such words as we would want God to hear. You know, through this uh, discussion here, uh, the old the statement of, of uh, Martin Luther that we are saints and sinners simultaneously certainly comes forward. Okay, well, it's, looks like we've been around. So the man who ought never to be a teacher. Who among you is a man of wisdom and of understanding? Let him show by the loveliness of his behavior that all he does is done with gentleness. If in your heart you have a zeal that is bitter and self-ambition, do not be arrogantly boastful about your attainments, for you are false to the truth. Here, James goes back, as it were, to the beginning of the chapter. His argument runs like this. Is there any of you who wishes to be a real sage and a real teacher? And let him live a life of such beautiful uh, graciousness that he will prove to all that gentleness is enthroned as a controlling power within his heart. For if he has a fanatical bitterness, and if he is obviously controlled by selfish and personal ambition, then whatever claims he, in his arrogance, many uh, may make, all he does is to be false to the truth which he claims to teach. In this passage, James uses two interesting words. The word he uses for zeal is zealous. In Greek, zealous is a magnificent, most significant word. It need not be a bad word at all. It can and often does mean the noble emulation which a man feels when he is confronted with some picture of greatness and goodness. But there is a very narrow dividing line between noble emulation and ignoble envy and jealousy. The word James uses for selfish ambition is eteria. Eteria was also a word which no necessary, which with no necessity, necess okay, try it again, with no necessarily bad meaning. It originally meant spinning, spinning for hire and was used of serving women. Then it came to 
mean any work that is done for pay. And it came to mean the kind of work that is done simply and solely for what can be got out of it. Then it entered politics and came to mean that selfish ambition, which is out of self and for nothing else, which is ready to in, uh, ready to intrigue and to plot and to use any means to gain its ends. A scholar and a teacher is always under a, a double temptation. He is under the temptation to arrogance. Arrogance was the besetting sin of the rabbis. The greatest of the Jewish teachers were well aware of that. In the sayings of the fathers, we read, he that is arrogant in decision is foolish, wicked, puffed up in spirit. It was the wise advice of one of the wise men. It rests with the colleagues to choose whether they will adopt their thy opinion. It is not for thee to force it upon them. There are few who are in such constant spiritual peril as a teacher and a preacher. They are used to being listened to. They're used to having their words accepted. They are used to telling people rather than listening to people. All unconsciously they tend, as Shakespeare had to say, I am Sir Oracle, and when I ope my lips, let no dog bark. It is very difficult to be a teacher or a preacher and to remain humble. But however difficult it is, it is absolutely necessary. He is under the temptation to bitterness. We know how easy learned discussion can produce passion. The Odum Theologicum is notorious. Sir Thomas Brown has a passage on the savagery of scholars to each other. Scholars are men of peace. They bear no arms, but their tongues are sharper than Actus's razor. Their pins carry farther and give a louder report than thunder. I had rather stand the stock of a I don't know what that is, basculum, then the fury of a merciless pen. Philip Linney reminds us how Dr. H. F. Stewart described the arguments of Pascal with the Jewish uh, Jesuit Alan Vex fight with the crew of the, of the convent as he Kidnapped, sword in his hand, flashed like quicksilver into the middle of our flying enemies, and at every difficult things in the world is argued without passion, and to meet arguments without wounding, to be utterly convinced of one's own beliefs without at the same time being bitter to those others is no easy thing, and yet it is a first necessity of the Christian teacher and scholar. We may find in the passage four characteristics of the wrong kind of teaching. One, it is fanatical. The truth holds it holds is held with unbalanced violence rather than with reasoned conviction. It is bitter. It regards the opponents as enemies to be annihilated rather than as friends to be persuaded. It is satisfying ambition. It is in the end more eager to display itself than to display the truth. And it is interesting more in the victory of its own opinions than in the victory of the truth. Four, it is arrogant. The whole attitude is pride in its own knowledge rather than humility in its own ignorance real scholar will be far more aware of what he does not know than of what he knows. 
Well, it was certainly the section for the pastor to read, wasn't it? Any comments? Uh, go ahead, buddy. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, it's a, it's a, it was a good passage for a pastor to read, and I think we commented on that last week, but uh, being a teacher is, can be a big responsibility, a very big responsibility. Preacher, you know, far beyond that, but a couple of weeks ago, I was uh, asked to serve on the board of uh, Mosaic Interfaith Ministries. It formerly was uh, Lutheran Social Services, and I went to an outdoor meeting. And the director, Dr. Whited, she wanted to know some kind of factoids about my life to present to the board so they could vote on me and so forth. And so, you know, we talked about the history of my long life. And then she said, well, what about your kind of religious life? And I said, well, you know, Leslie knows that I'm an Orthodox Christian. I said, well, I was at one time ordained as a reader in the Orthodox Church, but I never served as a reader or seldom served as a reader. But I did teach Sunday school for a long time. And uh, most recently, I taught a class for eight or nine years to high school seniors on the Sermon on the Mount. So we went through this whole meeting, right? And uh, after the meeting, uh, people came up to introduce themselves. Other people at the meeting, the other board members came to introduce themselves and chat with me a little bit. They didn't want to know anything about my life or activities that Leslie had mentioned, my long life going back to, you know, born in the late 40s. They wanted to know about my views on the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> so my my history as a teacher was, was what kind of stuck in their heads after this lengthy meeting. So I thought it's kind of curious, you know, being being tested on your, your views as a teacher. And, you know, people, that was the one thing that kind of stuck with people. Oh, this guy used to be a teacher. He used to teach the Sermon on the Mount. So yeah, being being a teacher can be a it, it's a, an opportunity. It's a great opportunity, but it can also be a great responsibility. Uh, I also it reminds me this these four uh, things here of exactly how not to do outreach. As I know, a lot of people who try to do what they call uh, Christian outreach to unbelievers, but they actually turn out to be using these very same four characteristics. So it goes to a lot of people, I think. I think that, that what we what we read here is certainly. Uh, Stating the obvious as far as uh, how a person in a position of teacher, which is every adult that has a child, uh, has a tremendous influence, a tremendous responsibility, and um, it's easy to overstep. Okay, well, our time has ended for today. It's nice to have all of you with us today in the study.